she flew through the night air on missions of destruction and everything she touched turned to death and disease. She was the hag, the devil's agent, the poisoner, the one with the evil eye. This false image of a witch as, a, as an old hag, first of all, the witches were not all old. The women who were burned were not all old. There were some old women. There were a lot of children. Uh, it certainly affected how we look at women today, and it's used as a great put-down that women are hags. Hag used to uh, mean sacred knowledge, a woman who had sacred knowledge. Uh, old women used to be uh, revered because they did have this ancient knowledge and sacred knowledge and passed it on to others so that it was uh, wonderful to be an old woman. There is evidence that women did meet in groups to participate in the old rituals and to exchange news. But as the witch persecutions reached their height, meetings like these became more and more dangerous. Women who gathered at night were thought to be evil, an idea reinforced by the art and literature of the time. It was an age of superstition, and so no one doubted the existence of witches. It was difficult not to believe when thousands were being burned. Historians call it the Renaissance and Reformation, a time of rebirth in art and learning. An age of church reform. It was also the dawn of the scientific revolution. The telescope was invented and a new world was discovered. The scientific revolution relied explicitly and heavily on the techniques of the Inquisition, the techniques of questioning witches in the witch burnings. Francis Bacon, who's one of the fathers of the scientific method and one of the leading exponents of the scientific revolution, talked about how important it was to use the techniques of the Inquisition to tease or torture the secrets out of Mother Earth or Mother Nature. It was an age that marked the rise of the bureaucratic state and the emergence of capitalism. In cities all over Europe, a new profit ethic was beginning to take hold. The witch hunts were a business. They were profitable. For each witch trial, there'd be meticulous bookkeeping. Every single step of the witch trial would be costed. There'd be a charge for going and getting the witch and seizing her. There'd be a charge for escorting her. There'd be a charge for locking her up and guarding her. There'd be a charge for someone to bring her meals if she were given, given meals. There'd be a charge for someone to keep the books of all of these charges. Every single step generated costs, and those costs had to be paid by somebody. If the witch had any property at all, her property would pay those costs. Her assets would be confiscated and seized she not only had to pay the bills for her own capture, imprisonment, torture, and execution, but there was a whole secondary industry that sprang up around the witch burnings. First, it provided amazing employment opportunities for lawyers, for judges, for people who would sit on the tribunals. Now anyone could be accused. And the witch hunts were well-organized campaigns. 
One accusation by a neighbour set the wheels in motion. When a woman was accused of being a witch and went in front of the Inquisition, she'd be in jail, first of all. She may have been tortured first. Would have been out in the town square or in front of the town church. Because we're not talking about cities. This all happened in rural areas. Most of the witches were in rural areas, almost all of them. So it's a small town thing. Everybody comes out to look. The witch is brought out. She is, first of all, stripped of her clothes because she may have a spell in her clothes or something sewn into the hem which is made out of the skin of an unbaptized child or something like that. So she's stripped of all her clothes. She's shaved. Both the hair on her head and her pubic hair are shaved because hair has always been thought to have a lot of power. Even, you know, we know the myths of Samson and so on. But also that women, when they braided their hair, were thought to braid men's fate with this kind of thing. So it was a magic technique. So she had all her hair removed. But she had to approach the Inquisitor walking backwards so she can't give him the evil eye. And the Inquisitor is somebody who is from the city. He's been appointed by the church or in later times by the ruler or whoever was in charge. So this poor rural woman who turns around to face this man that she may never have seen anything like that before in her life, he probably speaks much better French or English or whatever than she does. So the witch approaching the Inquisitor is just totally dumbfounded, has no idea what's happening to her. Many could not withstand the methods of torture used to extract confessions. Enclosure in the Iron Maiden was like being buried alive. Frederick von Spee, a Jesuit priest, disillusioned by what he saw as a confessor to condemned witches, wrote, Why do you search so diligently for sorcerers? Take the Jesuits, all the religious orders, and torture them. They will confess. If some deny, repeat it a few times. They will confess. Should a few still be obstinate, exorcise them. Shave them. Only keep on torturing, they will give in. Take the canons, the doctors, the bishops of the church. They will all confess. They were tortured three times. The first time, a lot of people got through and didn't confess. By the end of the second time, virtually everybody confessed because the torture was absolutely monstrous. Uh, and then we have the question of the third degree. We get that term in English from the fact that this third level of torture would uh, virtually, uh, if they didn't kill the people, everybody confessed. The torturer made her sit on the rack, undressed her, and applied the thumb screws. When the thumb screws were applied to her toes, she cried out louder than before. The Inquisitor inserted the mouth pair and demanded that she confess. When it was removed, she told her story. Ten years ago, it happened that the devil came to her in the guise of a man. First they danced, and then they dined, and then she and others knelt before the goat and kissed him. Here she named eight neighbors. survives. O oh, husband, they take me from thee by force. How can God suffer it? My heart is nearly broken. Alas, alas, my poor dear children orphaned. Husband, send me something that I might die. 
or I must expire under torture. If thou canst not today, do it tomorrow. Write to me directly, R.L. This is all taking place under the idea that it's fulfilling the books of the Bible. And if, uh, and you might know that the New Testament has two commandments. One is love the other as yourself. Do you see that being expressed in the mythology as it's being um, lived in Western Europe at this time? Do we see it expressed in the way the remnants of these ideas are still ruling our world today?